Salud, amigos. Greetings, friends. Crew member of our beloved, polluted, and unique spacecraft, which, since the last time that we met on this network, has taken another turn about its imaginary axis, and of course continues creating events in full development. As I am not standing up with the map in the background, as the beautiful one that we have here, is because we have a guest, a very important guest. So, I will briefly introduce Álvaro García Dinera, Vice President of the Plurinational State of Bolivia. And to speak about this topic, because every minute is important in TV, and this goes beyond a commonplace, as our producer states. Bolivia has a very important range for the United Nations today. Just to be accurate with the details, you know that I never use a teleprompter. You're a non-permanent member of the Council of Security of the United Nations, a host of the G77 of China 2014, pro tempore President of Unasur. This is a resume that does not honor your long trajectory. And sometimes I wonder if you, as you're so young and have so many duties, are you actually gray haired or do you dye your hair gray to look older? Maybe not older, but to look wiser to look a little bit older than the age that you have. You have worked for so long in international politics. Well, Walter, first of all, greetings and thank you for coming to Bolivia. We appreciate this and we always follow you. We always follow your shows. Bolivia has indeed changed greatly. For the last decade or 20 years, Bolivia was known worldwide as the poorest country of Latin America, the most unstable country of Latin America, and maybe even of the whole world, an unfair country with very few millionaires and a lot of poor people. And from this sad story that we had 20 years ago, Today, there is a different Bolivia, a Bolivia that is respected internationally, that participates together with Venezuela, with Ecuador, with Brazil, with Argentina, building a new Latin American structure with UNASUR, with CELAC, but also as a country, a country with an important presence internationally, the leadership of an indigenous president. Now we're in the Security Council. We've had a summit of G77 here in Bolivia. So we're a country that today is proud and dignified to welcome the international community. And we don't only welcome them, but we have things to say. Things for the world, things about natural resources, things about international security, things about globalization, things about human rights, about water, about Mother Earth. Our country is now part of the international context as a country with an agenda. And it's not only dragged by an agenda defined by the great powers of the world. The change is exponential, but not only in numbers, but in the quality of the management of the country. I remember when speaking about the coups, I was in the one for Garcia Mesa, and I can quote other coups that are not important right now. But the cameraman and myself were facing difficult circumstances, but for some reason this magical country allows us to love it. It's a very lovable country. Maybe it's because it's the favorite daughter of the liberator, and it creates a lot of positive news. Because before we only heard about coups, over 170 coup d'etats in our history, a country that was often overseen in the world news, and whenever we're shown, it showed the worst index of poverty and the stability. Today, things are different. Our country has a very strong indigenous roots and a great tradition, and you are very proud, just like we are. Because previously, people wanted to hide this, of course. But now, how 
do you want to progress with a country, a country that hides half of its existence? Today, the country is now modern. We look at modernity and we look at it with a keen eye. However, we're still proud of our indigenous roots, of our plurinational roots. So this meeting between the old and the new between the root and the horizon has transformed us into a country that today always has positive news. It's the fourth consecutive year that we have the greater levels of growth. We've reduced extreme poverty exponentially. We've been able to integrate our racialized society where power, money, prestige were distributed based on the color of their skin. And we've been able to do this. We've been able to dismantle this. And now it is a country that seized back its energy, its power, and that only after a decade Bolivia once again is part of the international context as an example. An example of a revolutionary country, an example of a socialist country, of a country directed by humble people, by working people, but that it can show the world indexes for democracy, indexes for integration, for participation, for economic growth, index for distribution of wealth, as well as proposals that globally create an agenda and this is related to how we have come back to meet our own force we haven't seen the outside to avoid the bad as we did before and now we build our own faith with what we have with what we are and this is what has allowed us to progress to progress in such a great way during the last decade the achievements can never be discussed and any country should be proud or government should be proud about this but i can see a continuity with the management governments are not changing and then different directions are shown there's a sense of nation and continuity am i right well continuity is decisive walter because between the years 2000 and 2005, in five years we have five different presidents. What can a country do with one president per year? What kind of stability of long-term planning can you have? None, none at all. And that's why this were five years that were lost, they were terrible for the country. But if we look back, we see an unstable country politically because there weren't any projects that could integrate all of us, so everyone was fighting against the rest and the regional fractions, the ethnic fractions, as well as the class fractions had turned our country into the poorest of the continent with Haiti, our dear Haiti. Well, today, as you say, we are an example an example of a populist government, the most academic and perfect sense of the word populist, a populist government that creates a stability with a long-run horizon for the country, a populist country that after one decade has taken 20% of its population, actually 22% out of the conditions of extreme poverty, a populist country that has grown its economy in 12 years four times, four times, a populist country that, based on macroeconomic terms, shows the best figures of South America. So yes, we are a populist country, a country that has taught lessons to the non-populist countries about what is the management of satisfactory economy by reserving our sovereignty and also complying with the great objectives that we have as a nation. So, evidently, Bolivia is no longer the place of coup d'etat or the death of Che, because this was what Bolivia was to the world, the place where Che died and the place where always there was a coup. Now, Bolivia is a model of what a left-wing government can do. It is a model of what can be done by integrating the indigenous peoples together with the mixed rate people in order to build a new integration, a plurinational integration of the people.
And we feel proud. And we want for the records that Bolivia is setting today can continue. But also, we want to shed some light over the rest of the continent. Well, we are achieving this because we are now a reference for many people in the great nation of Latin America and the Caribbean, as we say. Thank you very much, Walter. And this is why we're here to pay you a tribute and to learn learn from the leaders about how this process has taken place. Walter, we welcome you. We are a very simple country. Our people are humble and we are workers. Well, our simplicity and our work now become, well, they were usually a synonym of misery and abandonment. Now we're a source of energy, of dignity, of growth, of sovereignty, of conquest, of the development that was always yearned. Without losing our humility, without losing our way of working, we're building a different way of understanding each other and looking at each other at the same level. We're all the same at the end of the day. Well, as clear as as you're stating this with the academic and media terms that you are using today, the reality can be seen in every step that you take in the city. But also, this friendly rivalry between Santa Cruz de la Sierra and Bogotá, what has been of this? Because I've been in both cities, but I visited them different times. Well, Bolivia, for 170 years, dragged three geological faults of our state, the regional fault, which was power and wealth concentrated in the capitals of the departments and the west and the rural zones and the eastern zones that were left to get 100 years ago, Walter, to reach the border with Brazil in the north, it took us a whole year, one year to get from the capital from La Paz to Cobija. So what integration can this be? And from the different sectors of the Orient, there was a distance with the rest. So this is geological fault of the construction of our country that has led to inequality, and we dragged this. We dragged this to 2008. It was an elite of foreign names that showed the whiteness of the skin as a synonym of distinction that would take a turn due to endogamy for wealth, for power, for politics. And they marginalized most of the indigenous population of the farmers, and they kept them away from the achievements of the citizens. This is the second structural fault of our colonial inheritance that it was never overcome with the creation of the Republic, nor with the Revolution of two, nor with democracy on its first stage. And the third fault was the dependency on external powers, economically, culturally, First from Spain, then the English, after the English left, the Americans came. So it is a country that has been built over quicksand with three faults, three geological faults, and these impeded us for creating solid foundations for our identity for our nationality. We have tackled these three topics. The most important one is the regional one. We have a constituent assembly. We've created a regime for regional autonomy that gathers national, local identities, redistributes wealth, but also this state is concerned about creating integration. Today, you can go from the borders with Paraguay and Brazil and reach the border with Peru or the border with Argentina or the border with Brazil. And you can do that in one day, not one year, as it used to happen just some years ago. So the regions, the regions with the East, ahead of them that was placed between the west and the rest of the countries 
is now part of the plans for the development of the political acknowledgements and the old rivalry between the East and the West that even led, well, eight years ago, nine years ago, a group of people wanted to divide Bolivia. It was a group of mercenaries that wanted to divide Bolivia through armed actions. We were able to overcome this. And this regionalist feeling has been kept that as a healthy rivalry, no longer with revenge or with isolation, but as part of a collective identity, a wider collective identity. So we've resolved the geological fault. We've resolved the class fault and also the colonial geological fault that made us dependent of whenever the states sneezed or whenever they wanted to think about Bolivia, no longer. Now Bolivia depends on our forces, on our capacities, on our brothers of Latin America. Ever since I have been a child in my school, the school I was honored to attend before going to the Air Force, it was the PU school founded in 1987, it was the first observatory, and we had a map. The map was there. The problems were there, and there was a priest who admired greatly, who used to be part of the first line of infantry in the Chaco War. You, with your academic background, could you please tell us about what happened before? In a bourgeois school, as the one I attended, the priest told me this was due to the oil interest of the empires that wanted to take our sovereignty, and that person was reliving his role as member of the infantry. And he said, I was part of my country in the battlefield. I was part of my country working like this. So from your academic background, could you please tell us a little bit about the rivalry between the old companies that were even combating for fresh water places when a republic started, a great part of our borders, especially leading to the Amazon, to Brazil, and to the Chaco, this is a very distinct environment in this territory. It's very dry, full of sand. And we had problems with the bordering. So at the beginning of the 20s, in the 20th century, the oil companies that were brought by liberalism that was fashionable in the country. So that's where they all were listening, right? And then neoliberalism came 80 years later. Back then, liberalism, both for the economic and political areas, invited or brought the presence of foreign companies that are exploring the areas of Chaco. Chaco is in the south of Bolivia and in northern Paraguay, and they were looking for oil, of course, and they were able to find oil wells. So there was a dispute between the companies to control this area, the area that they knew and they knew that was going to be very important as their resource for the world. What were the companies? On the one hand, we had English oil companies and American oil companies. This is the transition from one empire to the next, from the decaying English empire that was then replaced by the American empire. So there were oil companies that wanted to take control over these areas, and each oil company had a government on their side. On the one hand, the Bolivian government and the Hawaiian on the other hand. So these two brother countries, very poor countries, both of them, started fighting. They started a war, a war in a territory they barely knew. None of the two countries where indigenous peoples lived that were fully disconnected of the realities of Paraguay and Bolivia. But we were looking for the control of the oil wells, both in the cities and the fields. But this war, beyond deciding, well, initially it was a war between oil companies, and they used as soldiers 
the people, the people of Bolivia and Paraguay. And in the Bolivian nation, this woke a feeling of integration because in the sense of Chaco, the professional of the city met the indigenous people of the Aymara, of the Quechua tribes, and they were facing death for a common cause with the same circumstances. Before this, they had nothing in common. Some were citizens, some were not. They did not have rights, but in war, that linked them together. And this created a feeling of integration, of nation, of that, of sacrifice. All these problems, there is no water, a drop of water is the dearest treasure there. So they died defending the interests of companies. But while defending and facing that, they met and acknowledged themselves as Bolivians, indigenous and mixed with professionals and farmers, workers and crafters. So when they came from war, defending the nation, they said, listen, for a long, long time we've been marginalized. Brothers, parents, family members have died due to the old companies. At the end of the day, Bolivia is the same. So after this, there was a feeling of nationalism that created first the left-wing parties and then the nationalist parties with a tendency to military nationalism. This is something that not everyone has been able to show. And you are the lecturer that we require for this because dossier is about every category of the society and the culture. So could you give us a lecture on this topic? As long as it is in line with what you want to say, because you have the floor. The soldiers and the citizens went to Chaco to die for other people's interests. And when they came back with the victory of defended the nation, but on the other hand, with the defeat of losing another piece of our territory, there was a cultural revolution. A revolution that was for the farmers. The farmers started creating structures. Not only community structures, but regional and national structures of the working people, the Federation of the Miners, the Mining Central of Bolivia, and the soldiers, soldiers that then became tenants, captains, colonels, and who said, until today, we've been governed by the owners of farms and of mining companies, and they have led us to the death for other people's interests. Is our time? to take charge of this country, the country we love. We've lost our lives to this country. We've lost our relatives, we've lost our friends. We need to rescue it. And ever since, inside the armed forces, there was a fringe, a fringe of a patriotic avant-garde line. The army members were the first one who nationalized the oil companies. The company is Standard Oil. Huh, long history of this company. Well, it was nationalized. They created the first oil company of Bolivia, IPFB. They created a work code, a, a very important one. Huh, interesting. What year we speak about? This is 1938. The war ended in 1936. So, this way of working of the army created a group of ideas that are still important today in Bolivia. The armed forces were led by a colonel that now has an oil company and the leading company of Bolivia, the one with the greatest resources for the productive activity, for education activities, for work activities, was created by this army member. So there was a generation of the Chaco War that on the military basis was very progressive for its time and also on the political side allowed the creation of political parties that were both nationalist and also the creation of Marxist parties. So this was all a consequence of the war. Yes, the effect was great. So you've been the pioneers in many things even though this has not been spread to the rest of the world.
Our code of work, our labor code, is still, is still working today. We are just modifying it today to add new areas of the Constitution, but it's been an excellent code that is still effective today, as well as the creation of the most important oil company of the country, which is the core of the Bolivian economy. That is something else you have in common with Venezuela and also with Mexico. Bolivia is like a transversal axis of the continent. Sometimes I always speak about the great nation and I speak about the Caribbean. They have a lot of things to say. Back then, they also nationalized the hydrocarbon resources with a great political cost as well, with Cárdenas. With Cárdenas. From your academic point of view, if I may, where is the great nation going? This is a leitmotiv for me every night. Today, today, the direction is not the best. There are a lot of issues in the great nation, but there's always been problems for the great nation. I've been able to overcome the adversities. That's why we create antibodies, and we'll continue doing so, but there's a sediment. What has been done, if you see from the times of Bolívar, you can see he walked from the north and he reached this place. Never. The Latin American continent was as bound together politically as it happened with President Maduro and Chávez, with Lula, with Kirchner. With Correa and Uruguay with Frente Amplio, with Tabaré and Mujica. Never before we had this integration, this closeness, because before every country looked north to change the ministers, to get an agreement with neighboring country, they first asked the American embassy, and if the embassy said yes, then they held meetings in this great decade. From 2000 to 2011, 2012, 2013, Latin America is something that had never happened since the time of liberators happened. We've built CELAC, we've built UNASUR, there's been an integration of the presidents and the affairs were resolved by ourselves, by the Latin Americans, without the interventions of the OAS that has always been a puppet of the United States or even themselves. I think Benedetti was the one who said, I, I'm not clear about who said this, but he said that the Ministry of the Colony of the United States is the OAS, and it will continue being so. It will continue doing this. So this political integration that we built was the continuation of what Bolivar did one century ago. What were we missing in the first wave? Economic integration. Because there are sediments. This creates a foundation that is even more solid than the affinity of the politicians of the revolution. And I think that this is the destination of the great nation. This is not only a beautiful phrase. This is something that's unavoidable and necessary if Latin America wants to be relevant in the planetary context. Walter, the United States is a continental state. Russia, China are continental states as well. Europe is a continental state. Who are the ones tracing the fate of the world, these powers. The rest, the rest of us are not tracing any path. When will Latin America become influent in the Latin American continent whenever we stop working as a country, when we stop imitating external patterns, when this continent from Mexico and from the wall, when the wall will be built, it will be great because we will be able to tell Mexico, you come from the South, you are part of this. Having a character as the one in the White House could help us for this because it's a bull in a crystal shop. I don't want to offend the bulls, but indeed, 
Mexico is now looking south. They tend to look north. Well, and there was this idea of building a wall that needed to be paid by them. But people often forget that the position of President of the United States also comes together with the position of Commander in Chief. And I believe that this person wants to become the Commander in Chief. And the technological military apparatus behind him is eager for this. But if we Siempre continue doing what the North does, it y might happen, but we will always be different to them. And the way of saying this is building a wall, which is hitting the Latin in the face. This is coming back to the feuds, the creation of a state and Mexico to Tierra del Fuego. This, at some point, this was the dream of Bolivar, and this has been relieved by Evo, Chavez, Lula, Kirchner. This, this should work as a plurinational continental state, diverse with its cultural identities, but with institutions that work as a continent and are unified for production, that are together for law, for finances, for knowledge, so that we can create the faith of the world that could favor the Latin Americans. Today, our division makes us smaller. We are small. How can we influence the world if we are doing this country by country? But together, we have natural resources, population, market, lithium, oil, food, biodiversity, exotic minerals, and maybe the reason for the war of the future, water, lots of water. Here we have the water. So if at some point this continent will become relevant with the world, it will be when we are integrated as a continental pre-national state that will create two levels of government, a continental government of certain institutions and a national level as well, with its history, with its tradition, with its heroes, with its culture, but it will never deny the second tier of continental institutions that will define the prices, that will define the markets continentally, that will define policies for the planet. So this is our fate. We were close to this during the last decade. There's some setbacks. We've taken some setbacks. Five leaders were sick at the same time. And we need to be suspicious about this. And this was a magical time, wasn't it? And it was the only one. The only one over 150 years. 200 years maybe, 200 years of being a continent, because before that there was the fight of the left wings and the militias that creating the division of the continent, but there was never articulation of government and states sharing the same horizon, sharing the same goal. I will never speak ill about the tricontinental states. But the moment where the progressive presidents worked together was very difficult to criticize because they were working under the framework of liberal democracy, to say so. But of course, they were doing the thing they needed to do. And with a very clear and simple idea, the destination, the faith, of Latin America should be decided by Latin Americans, not by people from the States, not by Asians, not by Europeans. This is basic. And it's not the America for the Americans that came from the above. No. This is not what they want to do. They want to have the world turning around the United States. This was the world and a continent defining us by ourselves. In a country, in a continent that has been as humiliated as ours, Walter in Bolivia maybe 12, 13 years ago, to be a commander of the armed forces, you had to be permitted, licensed by the American army. Could you repeat this? Because it's something we need to listen. You are stating something that I wanted to know from a reliable source, and what better source than yourself? They needed to be licensed 
by the American Army to be commander of the forces. The names submitted to the assembly to choose the commanders were reviewed by the North American Embassy, and they were always the names that attended the courses in the United States for military training and strategic training to bring their family there to be trained politically. Those were the commanders of the armed forces and the police. Politicians, in order to be candidates for the Congress or to become ministers, they needed to have a visa. Here, having an American visa was having the blessing of God because this defined whether you were able or you were unable or not. The case was such that one of the last ambassadors to our own politicians of the Amener, ADN, MIR parties had to be dressed up as cowboys. They were marching around the embassy dressed as cowboys, and all of them were just waiting to be greeted by the ambassador, because this meant that they could be congressmen in the next term or ministers in the next government. You can see this in the pictures of the papers. It hurts, because this is not a movie, it's not an Italian movie. This hurts. And after listening to someone as reliable as you, it hurts to listen that this happened indeed. I was not willing to acknowledge it at a given time. But yes, we have papers, we have collective memory, and still today, we have the stepchildren of the lucky politicians that still go to the embassy of the United States to celebrate New Year or the arrival of the new representative or Thanksgiving as well. These people have no shame, have no shame at all. And they just follow their leader. They are willing to lick their feet just for some economic help, just for some advisory. Walter, in Chapare, there is an airport in Chimoré. Not even the president of Bolivia could land there without the authorization of the American Embassy. In the central bank of Bolivia, it is a building. It is the second highest of La Paz. The first one is Casa del Pueblo, the House of the People. Amen to that. In the 17th story, of this building, there was a floor with members of the IMF. It was paid by the Bolivians. It was part of the central bank, and they were the ones defining the economic policies of our country. And in the palace, even with President Evo, one month, there was an office of the CIA in one of the corners of the old palace of the government. So you had all the state. The Ministry of Economy had its own salary, 4,000. But the embassy of a European country gave them an extra bonus of three times or four times the salary. And there were three or four ministries for given embassies with bonuses. Other ministries, like the one of environment and water, also had a bonus from the World Bank, other ministries with a different embassy. So we didn't have a government. The Bolivian government didn't decide anything. It was only a puppet against the voting people. But in reality, the one managing the economy and the policies of our country were different stakeholders, different actors. That that's why there was so much hatred against Evo, because he broke all of this. CIA, out. IMF, out. American Embassy, go ahead and organize your parties in your country. Don't have our politicians dressing as cowboys or Spider-Man for them to be unable to work. People of the DA, go make your business with drug trafficking elsewhere. Don't come here for your business. So we've set things clear. 
and we're not isolating them. We are becoming part of the world, but in equal conditions. We've erased this dependency of the colony, and this has led to the hatred of those who live by this, those who receive their salary for doing whatever the American embassy said. They hate us. They loathe us. A continuous conspiracy of the most powerful who will never accept that a country as poor as Bolivia that was always so dependent, always so miserable, that never had any dignity, today is a solid, a sovereign, a dignified country. They will not tolerate this. And it hurts even most that it's a demonstration that we can. And with an indigenous people, with an indigenous person as president, this hurts them. We are proud of having Evo as a president. Bolivia is the beloved daughter of the liberator. And finally, Walter, Bolivians receive our salary from our own resources. Please explain this. Our country, a very wealthy country about minerals and hydrocarbons, whatever you want to name, we have it. But this did not belong to Bolivia. This belonged to different foreign companies. So when I met with some foreign politicians, I will not speak the name of the country, they told me, Alvaro, your country has 45% of the GDP controlled by two countries. What are you going to do with this? Two countries were controlling almost half of the GDP of Bolivia. President Carlos Mesa was in office two years before us, and to pay for the bonuses, he had to go to the United States to ask money to the IMF or the World Bank. There was a fight between the army members and the police officers in the square because President Sánchez Lozada had to increase taxes, taxes who received salaries because he did not have enough money to pay the salary of educators in the following month. And the United States did not listen, did not listen to their friend because they were busy with other wars, probably. So salaries were raised and the military and the police fought in the square. Many were killed. So it was a country that had a lot of trouble making and meat. And at the end of the month, we needed to look for someone to give us money. And this was the history of Bolivia for decades. But now, today, Bolivia can define the increase of the salary. We will define this. We're not asking the IMF or the World Bank. We're not asking them for money or permission. We're going to invest this money in school, in roads, with our own resources. So it is a country that has put things in order. We at all, this oil belongs to the Bolivians. We have minerals, they belong to the Bolivians. We have energy, it belongs to the Bolivians. And with the money generated from these goods, we're able to distribute the wealth to increase the production, lithium, the industries, this money to integrate Bolivia, the East and the West, this money to improve education, and this money to improve the salaries, to raise them. So it is a country that holds itself. And we are dignified about this. When you speak about sovereignty, if your salary is not guaranteed by your own work, then sovereignty is nothing but speech. But when sovereignty is based on a political speech, but also economic sustainability, then sovereignty makes sense, and it has a reason. And this is what we have been able to achieve in the last decade. And you've done this in such a way that has bothered some people and made others proud because this is a fundamental part of the great nation of Lamarck and the Caribbean. And this is what we're building. And we'll need to rebuild the great nation, Walter, because or we do this or Lamarck will still be the small continent that we are today. And we will mean nothing to this conflict, to this violent world. This is very interesting because 
you just spoke about this phrase. What do you see? How do you foresee the future? It is a cruel future that if we don't analyze our reality, we'll never be able to modify it. And the foreseeable reality that you imagine seems closer to reality because until now, you've never been mistaken, not because of what you said today, but because of your work. Walter, the world was undergoing two simultaneous processes. One, decadence of hegemony, because historic capitalism of the 1400s and the development, as well as the cycles of expansion of capitalism, first Europe, well, first the Netherlands and the market countries, the ones who had an army back then, and then Florence, and then Holland, they were the commercial states, the smaller states but had a lot of economic expansion. And there's always been a state that has led them, that has led the expansion of capitalism. And the last state that led capitalism has been, of course, the United States. At the end of the First World War and then until this expansion of globalization at the ends of the 20th century, their states have been king. But starting the 21st century, they have to start their decadence. And this is because they're no longer the first economy of the world. A great amount of their debt is given to other powers for them to carry out their military adventures, and they need to raise money because they can do this by themselves. Before that, managing the technology operate was the way of working, but now they cannot do this anymore. So now the United States are going down, and they're aware of this. And as they're aware of this, this is very dangerous, because they say the world is difficult, so I will come back to America, America for the Americans, United States first, so they start. They stay in their country, conservatively, no longer expansive. And then there are other powers that are looking for expansion, Germany, China. China and the Russian Federation. This, of course, will bring nightmares to the Americans. So a decadent way of working the planet is very aggressive and violent because on the one hand they are aware of this, but on the other hand they are not willing to give up. So they want to fight all the monsters, the monsters that come, that come with a stage of collapse and a stage of the end, and they're nearing the end. So this 20, 30 years ahead of us are the years that you're going to see all the worst things that will come from these towers that can affect the whole planet on the one hand. We are still not clear about who's going to be the new king. Some say China, some say Germany. We don't know who's going to be the new king. But this will also bring turmoil internationally. But on the one hand, the first wave of globalization has reached its end. Globalization, as we know, has been through different stages in the last 300 years. The last stage started with Reagan and Thatcher in the 80s. We started with the stage of globalization. With whom? With Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher. That was a duo that we'll never forget. They were the ones who ended the state of well-being. They started with the privatizations worldwide. And this is a stage of intense expansion of globalization, opening borders, free trade agreements, and others. But them going down. So what started, what drove the problems in 2008, in your opinion? Three things. World economy is no longer growing. Sorry, world trade 
is not growing at the same rate which was twice fold or three fold as it happened in the 80s and up to 2000. Before that economy grew two times and world trade six or five. World economy three, world trade nine. And since 2008, world economy grew by one time and the world trade by less than one. So there is a decline due to the most important engine that was globalized market. It is still growing, but not as much, not even at the same rate as global economy. Secondly, a setback of the capital, of a part of the financial capital that was going around the world. So there was a contraction of bonds. For investment was also constrained. And of course, there's still a flow of financial capital, but not at the same rate as before. So there's a process of deglobalization. England came back to Astor Island, their states back to their America, creating borders for the Latin Americans. They just raise the tariffs to China. They cannot fight China, so the only way is violating the own rules that they created for free trade. So the ones who started with globalization, England and the United States in the 80s, are now the countries that are the neo-protectionist countries. This is hypocrisy, isn't it? It's a paradox. Of course, globalization will not disappear. But as loan down globalization leads to a process of deglobalization that goes back to a nationalist protectionism for economy of the two great powers. And in Europe, they start to speak about this, whether it is necessary to once again be careful with the markets, to reduce the influence of the financial capital. And what happens if we break the NATO, hmm. for example? So, two things that happen, the collapse and the end of a part of the country and a new protectionism that is a slowing globalization. So, deglobalization as a consequence, and this, of course, creates an explosion. Initially, the North did not see a horizon. What's the horizon? What's the limit? Globalization? But Trump says no. Protectionism, Germany says no. Now China are kings of globalization, the former communists. And now North Americans are defending protectionism. So it's nonsense, right? So the neoliberals of the continent, where are they headed? They want neoliberalism, so they're communists with China. Are they protectionists then? So United States, and all the books of economy are now nothing but firewood, and they no longer have a speech. They have nothing to say because their leaders, their models, contradict themselves. Some look for free trade, others want protectionism. Some want to widen globalization, some want to slow down globalization. So this is creating chaos, mental chaos, ideological chaos, and economic chaos. We are at the start of a commercial war that we don't know. We have three minutes, and I want you to be the one who will force it with your academic knowledge and expertise. Listen, I only see chaos, chaos worldwide, and not a creative chaos. No, this is not a creative chaos. This is not the brainstorming of people from marketing. No, this is a destructive chaos, and it will become dangerous. Yes, it will. We are on the verge of even a nuclear war. There are people willing to press the button just to test their new nuclear weapons. It was stated the area of the atomic giants and the dwarves of ethics, but we never knew it was going to blow up in our face like this. So there's no horizon. We're not sharing horizon. There's nothing we can believe. And Latin America cannot 
este caos be living under the chaos of the planet. We should look down because we have everything to isolate ourselves from this storm if we work as a great nation. Is this idea crazy? I trust that there will be a second wave of progressive governments in Latin America. I hope that Mexico will take the first step. Poor Mexico, so far from God, so close to the United States but it is still a American country, and they have no other option. And they don't have an option. They need to look south. And with us, without looking north, seek our own faith, our own possibilities, integrating our economies, our market, and our young population. There's a great projection if we can plan, if we can plan this without projection for the future. So Latin America today, in a moment where the world starts crumbling on uncertainties, Latin America should be protected by integrating, not by firing each other's shots. So today we need integration. And of course, without nine bases and granting the sovereignty of the land, of the sea, and of the air. Well, for this, the peoples of the countries, the countries that have allowed the governments to create these colonial bases, to rebel. To rebel. We need to stop the canes of Latin America, as the Liberia said. How can they build a wall but then bring their military bases here? What is this? They're prostituting people in these places. Latin America should not fight with the United States, but we should not allow them. We should not allow them to drive us, to manipulate us. We should not allow the United States to do so. Professor, this has been a wonderful lecture. I personally would like to thank you because you've taught me things, you've confirmed some things. If you're not learning something every day, you're doing things wrong. But not every day we have the pleasure of listening to someone of your category and as coherent as you in your speech and with your academic background. Thank you, Walter. You're very kind. I'm just being fair with you. And also, we're in the land of the favorite daughter of the liberator that joins us together with Artigas, who created the first agrarian reform and had to die in exile. But then we also defeated the English fleet a couple of times. I will not speak about this today because there are still some open wounds. But whatever the case may be, thank you for allowing us to be there with you. I hope you enjoyed as much as I can tell you, I did in every single minute of this wonderful time. And I would like to proudly tell you that you are a permanent guest for this show that goes beyond what you can imagine because where we cannot reach with our satellites, we can reach with networks. I even received letters from the University of Japan. I am honored of having the chance to interview you. And as a person who has worked inside the monsters with the advisors of Kennedy, Briefly, the old campaigns in Venezuela were democratic actions with the Republicans and Coupe with the Kennedy advisors. I had very intense campaigns with these people, and if you ever need someone to throw a spirit for you, trust me, I am there for you. Thank you, Walter, for being here and for everything that you teach us every week. I feel very proud of having the chance of being interviewed viewing you, wherever you may be. Thank you for being there with you. This was Walter Martinez, producer and host of Dossier. Director, the floor is all yours.